Hindsight is so 2020. So many people wish they could have bought real estate back in 2009 when properties were half the price or even 75% off. But the truth is that when you're in it, you can't see it as clearly. In fact, those cheap properties were sitting on the market for months because there weren't enough buyers. People were scared. So what are the signs you should look for so that you can make smart and timely real estate investing decisions in the moment and not five or 10 years later? I'm Kathy Fedke. Welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today is Brenda Coleman. She's been investing for 17 years and got started when others were in panic mode back in 2009. How did she know and what's she looking for today? Well, she's here with us on The Real Well Show to share the mindset that's worked for her over the years that sometimes requires going against the grain and seeing what others can't see. Brenda, welcome to The Real Well Show. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's fun to be here. I got to get to know you much better when you came to our uh, retreat. Let's see, that well, that was the business one, right? It was uh, a real wealth retreat at our home. Yes. Yes, last yeah. year. Right? So, yeah, not this year, but last year. Yeah, we'll probably do another one because that was just so fun. Out 12 people together for the weekend and just focus on goals. And then I got to see you again at our Klamath Falls syndication project in Oregon. You live in Oregon. So what do you think of the project? So I think it's really exciting. So we were really excited to see it. And, um, you know, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, atmosphere, obviously, and, and neighborhood. And I mean, it seems like a really great opportunity, you know, for um, Fred and the builders and the investors and everyone to jump in with all of the um, basically, you know, utilities and development already in place and, and just be able to start building. Yeah. Yeah. Years have been cut off from the development process because that's already been done. And all we have to do is build beautiful homes that are in high demand up there. You don't live too far from Klamath Falls, right? How long was your drive? About four hours. So yeah, not too far. Oh, okay. That's pretty far. <laughs> that's pretty far. I was thinking closer. Yeah, it's definitely out there on the edge of Oregon. But uh, but there is a lot of demand. There were a couple of people on the tour that are planning on buying homes there. So so that was fun. But let's let's just talk about you and your real estate investing journey. We haven't done a real wealth story for a while. You are a member. You've also, like I said, been involved in so many things that we've done, like our the retreat at our house and, again, the recent tour to Klamath Falls. Um, how did you get started investing in real estate? And was it in Oregon? Um, yes, initially in Oregon. So we kind of um, jumped in with both feet in like 2006, 2007 time, luckily before the crash, but um, had been looking around, you know, wanting to do some investing, but prices were kind of going up like crazy. And so we ended up um, getting a good deal on a lot. Someone like has subdivided their property. And so we bought a lot and built a spec house. And so that was kind of the first thing that we did of kind of jumping in with, with both feet. And so built a spec house and sold it. Um, and then actually bought a lot, built our own house. So like general contracted our own house, um, and got done right at the very end. Um, right before actually had to luckily in our last month, um, we did a cash out refi. Our mortgage broker got us out because our construction lender that we were using was going under. Um, so we just got out and, and refinanced our house in the nick of time because it was supposed to be a construction to perm loan, but, um, we ended up getting the permanent loan from someone else, but luckily we're over 90% done on our house. So we could do that and just jump into another loan. But, um, then kind of watched as everything, um, went, you know, crashing down, um, and ended up going to uh, Central Oregon on vacation, so to Bend, which is about two hours north of Klamath Falls. Um, and everybody loves to vacation there in the state and um, started noticing some of the prices um, that, you know, we usually like yeah. to pick up real estate books. And we were like, oh, my God, you know, everything's like 75 percent off. And so our first investments were actually in 
that central Oregon area about two hours and actually about an hour and 45 minutes north of Klamath Falls where that grow development um, area is in the Sun River and the Bend area. Wow, what a market to invest in. It was crazy times to think how high prices went, you know, during 2006, 2007, and then how low they went in 2008, 2009, mainly. Uh, it was it was incredible. So did you buy rentals and uh, older homes and fix them up? and Or what did you end up buying? So we actually, I mean, there were all these developments because literally – um, the six month before that, like to shoots County in, in Oregon had been like the top fastest growing County in the country for developments. So there were a whole bunch of developments, new homes, builders that had walked away, like infrastructure in place. Um, and so we actually bought like short sales that were, you know, like developer owned. So like new houses or only 18 months old that people had just bought in those developments that were underwater and, and then it just walked away. Um, so that was kind of amazing. Um, and so, yeah, we just held them. Um, so we bought a few properties in that area, um, cause we were leveraging our money at that time and, and they'd gone down to only allowing you to have four investment loans, you know, if you were doing conventional loans at that time. So initially we just bought three out of the gate and we, you know, rented them out and waited, um, and then started, you know, as the market came back up then, um, cause again, for a while, they wouldn't let you do cash out refis on investment properties if it was conventional loans. So, um, waited to do that too, and ended up just kind of selling and then, then started investing out of state and in state still, okay. but, but cool. And you used the money that you made in Bend for those investments? We did. Yeah. So we ended up cashing out. Yeah. So when the market, you know, um, came back up, cause we essentially looked at it as, you know, we're buying real estate, like 75% off, you know? And so, um, yeah. held it. And as long as they could cash flow, um, we wish we still had those properties and had not, had not sold them <laughs> because, um, Ben has really gone crazy and the rental market's gone crazy there too. But, um, but anyway, so ended up, yep, cashing in, um, and buying some property in Arizona, buying property in Michigan, um, buying some duplexes and fourplexes. And so just kind of, um, continuing to play Monopoly, even though I hated that game when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long game. It takes forever yes. to get to the finish line. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are thinking, well, good for you. You got to buy when real estate was 70% off discounted. I mean, incredible. And I know what you mean about like, why did I sell? Why did I sell? Uh, it, it seems like a great time to sell when you sell. But if you're in a hot market, you know, you kind of look back like, oh, man, I missed out on a lot of equity. But hopefully you, you uh, reinvested it in markets that are growing as well. Yes. Yeah. So initially, um, you know, because I think that's something obviously everyone has to ask themselves is what, you know, what kind of your long-term exit, you know, or your exit strategy, you know, is it more short-term? Is it long-term? Yeah. Is it appreciation? Is it cash flow? Is it both? Um, and initially, um, I wanted to kind of retire myself because I'd been in social work and working with child abuse victims for a long time. And so just was taking an emotional toll on me. And so, um, so in the very beginning, we thought retirement, and then I thought, okay, my goal is to at least replace my income, you know, and so then focusing on cash flow. Um, so obviously, at the time, like I started buying in Michigan, it was a, a top cash flowing market. So definitely invested there for cash flow. But it's been ironic that, um, again, we got some good deals, and it's grown fairly significantly, too. And so we've actually seen some pretty um, great appreciation in that market as well. Um, which has been nice. Yeah, there's a lot of talk these days that that uh, Michigan and Ohio are going to be the next hottest markets because they're not too hot. <laughs> you know, there's, I just did a story on that interviewing the, he's a top executive over at CoreLogic and studies climate change. And he was saying that the Great Lakes tend to stay cool because of all the water and um, they're not going to, you know, necessarily feel the heat wave that other areas are going to feel. So it could be even more of an appreciation play over the next five to 10 years in, in Ohio and, and uh, Michigan. Are you in Detroit in Michigan? 
So suburbs, it's so funny that my friends were like, oh my God, you're buying real estate in Detroit. And I was like, suburbs. Um, so yeah, Oakland, so greater Oakland County. Um, so yeah, suburbs of Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, when people say a city that they're investing in, rarely are they actually investing in that city. Cities operate so differently than suburbs. Um, they have different politics. People often move out of the cities when they have families. So, um, you know, I'll say I invest in Dallas, but we're investing nowhere near Dallas. It's usually an hour away, you know, or if not further. So it, it can be confusing for sure if you're following the news media saying certain markets like Tampa, for exa example, um, has gotten a lot of flack for having increased inventory and home prices that are too high and insurance that's too high. But just just outside of Tampa and the suburbs where we invest, you know, it's a totally different story. So yes. uh, what, yeah, what are some lessons that you learned over the years that if you looked back, you would tell yourself to do things a little differently? Um, I think to take more risks actually than we did. Um, like we played it pretty safe. And so knock on something, um, you know, yeah, we've never lost money, um, played it pretty safe, but you know, there were some, definitely some properties that I think that we had an opportunity to buy that I should have worked a little harder to find some absolute way to buy them because now I look back and think, Oh my gosh, you know, if I'd bought that property, it would have been worth this much now, you know? And so, um, I think for me, it's definitely much more about regretting the moves that I didn't make, you know, of the, you know, okay, we might've played it a little more safely because obviously watching what happened to a lot of people in 2007, 2008, it's like, all right, you know, um, you know, just watching that we were being a little bit more careful um, sure. yeah, but I think that's the biggest thing is that not, not jumping in more and not buying more when I had the opportunity, you know, of figuring out a way, you know, even being a little bit more creative and maybe leveraging ourselves a little more than we actually did. Yeah. I think a lot of people still suffer from that, from the scars of 2008 and our, our, just constantly looking for that next shoe to drop. When is this going to happen again? When are we going to get properties for, you know, 75% discounts? And, uh, you know, are, is there going to be another foreclosure crisis? And what isn't um, looked at when people are in that fearful place is the fundamental differences of, of the, that market and this market. It was a credit bubble then. It was people who got housing that they never could qualify for those loans had they been fully and uh, carefully underwritten by a bank. They, it was just, we fill out a form and you've got a loan. Um, today, that's obviously not the case. You have to show every possible item, financial piece of paper that you have uh, to to get a loan. Plus, in most cases, you have to have a high credit, uh, high credit scores. And back then, you didn't have to have any history of paying your bills. You know, it just was, it was a completely different environment and uh, and so when you kind of look at the fundamentals, the demographic shifts, the population growth, um, the stability of housing today, the low foreclosures out there, the uh, the homeowners that are in the best position that they've ever been in with the lowest payments to income ever, you know, they don't yeah. have the stress that existed then where people couldn't couldn't afford their payments because they adjusted. We're on fixed rate mortgages today. So it, it you know, without knowing that, it's scary. And there's a lot of people still so scared that it's going to happen again. So with that said, what do you see as the risks out there today? Um, I think potentially like analysis paralysis. I mean, I think all of us got really spoiled over the course of the last 15 years, close to 15 years with the interest rates being as low as they were. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that you know, there was a lot of us that at first when the rates started going up, you weren't sure, you know, okay, when it's going to stop or, you know, so you're, you know, you're kind of sitting back and waiting on the sidelines and, you know, watching and waiting. And then, okay, everyone thought they were going to start coming down sooner and they haven't, you know, and so then here we are. And, um, you know, I think there's like some of us now that were like, all right, you know, like, I'm like, I'm not, you know, like at first I was, I was waiting and I was watching because, you know, I wasn't sure if they were going to keep going up or, you know, what was really going to happen, you know, with as high of inflation as we were experiencing for a while. Um, 
But now, you know, I think it's like, and I definitely feel like it's the time, you know, like if people are going to get in, like get in now, um, because I feel like rates, you know, at least they're predicting that they're going to start going back down, hopefully again in, in Q4 of this year. And so um, I think we're potentially in that little like opportunity, you know, bubble um, when people might still be sitting on the sidelines, still waiting, not jumping in that you could get some good deals and lock in something, you know, and then cash out, you know, refi later, you know, and take advantage of a better price. Because as soon as rates start going down, people are going to be able to afford more and we're going to be back into, you know, maybe more of the bidding wars that we experienced when the rates were lower is what I'm thinking. I don't know. Obviously no crystal ball. Yeah. Yeah. I think you nailed it. That's exactly what I think is going to happen is there's this little window where there's a pause. People are afraid of the election. They're afraid of, uh, you know, just these high interest rates and inflation and possibly uh, the high interest rates causing a recession. And that may happen, but I don't think it's going to happen in housing because the supply demand is just, it's, it's just off. The, uh, <clears throat> So that's a really, really great point that you make that this could be that little window. And it's funny because when you're in it, you can't see it. But when you're, you know, fast forward six months or a year or several years, it's so clear and obvious, right? I mean, when you jumped in to buy in Bend, you might have been alone. You know, there probably wasn't a lot of competition because people were still really scared, even though, like you said, it's like, but look at these prices, you know, like, why yeah. isn't everybody buying? Because when you're in it, you can't see it. What were people feeling? I mean, going back to that time, like you'd literally wonder how come people weren't buying when properties were half the price they were just the year before? Um, what got you over that hump? Um, I think it's funny because my husband and I, I think have very different investment, you know, kind of profiles. I'm much more of a, all right, yes, crunch the numbers and jump in. And he's like, no, let's wait and think about it and, you know, think about it some more and, you know, crunch numbers some more. And so, you know, it's always kind of a compromise with us. Um, but I just thought, I mean, for sure the numbers are going to come back to where they were for sure. You know, Bend is Oregon's Lake Tahoe area, you know, I mean, people, it was the fastest growing County for a reason, right? Like, and so, I mean, cause it's a great place to live. And so even though the market crashed, it hadn't changed that, you know? So it's like, okay, people are still going to be coming back here. People are still going to need a place to live. Um, at least at a minimum, housing prices are going to go back up to match the minimum in the rest of the state and rents are going to, you know, even if rent softened a little bit, that they're going to at least match what's in the rest of the state. And so I think you have to look at that. And even like, buying in the Midwest, you know, the Midwest just crashed. It didn't really go up and then come back down like a lot of the, you know, Phoenix, Vegas, Florida markets like that. It, it And so same thing I thought is, okay, at a minimum, these houses should at least come back to where they were 10 years ago, you know, and rents should be back there. And so, um, so I think when you just look, I look a lot at demographic trends like over time, right? And so what's the average entry point and payment that people are paying you know, in the rest of, you know, the greater area or the state or the county um, as kind of a, a basis for comparison. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's so smart. I, I was licking my wounds at that time. So we, we couldn't get loans and yet I knew it was the time to buy. Uh, but again, you fast forward to today and there is this pause, there's this moment where there's still a lot of fear out there and yet the fundamentals are there. There's more people that need housing than there's housing available. So you know that, you know, there can't be a, a housing crash in that scenario. There can't be a housing crash in the scenario where you've got people who own homes who have the lowest payment they've ever had in history. Um, and, and, you know, you just can't, there's not the distress there. You're not going to see prices come down. Uh, you also have a government that that is addicted to money creation and making more money even now just to pay the debt from the money they created before, and that creates inflation and usually in in the in asset values. So it is a really really unique opportunity before rates go down to get in before the masses come back in, and inventory levels even though they've gone up so much they're still at the the second it's the second lowest amount of inventory in history at this, this year. So it's not, even though there's increased inventory, it's not nearly where it needs to be. There's still 
tremendous need for housing and for rentals. We'll be teaming up with our San Antonio team and uh, doing a build to rent community that makes the investment totally passive for for our investors. Unfortunately, just the accredited investors because it is uh, syndication and um, that basically means you need a million dollar net worth outside of your home equity, or you earn $200,000 as an individual or $300,000 as a couple. You just have to meet one of those to be accredited and uh, you can invest in the, in the build to rent in San Antonio. But if you're not, then you can just buy a house from him and they, they're buying down the rates to four and a quarter percent. I don't, I don't know if it's still available today, but it was just uh, last week. Good, great opportunity. Same with Charlotte. I think they're buying down the rate. Uh, the Jacksonville team is, uh, it, it really makes a difference, really, really kicks in the cash flow when you do, when they do that. All right, Brenda. Well, thank you so much for being here on The Real Wealth Show. It's so fun to see you, and I hope to see you at one of our upcoming tours or events soon. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you would like to get more information on some of these hot markets that Brenda discussed, for example, uh, the Charlotte market or San Antonio, I think she also mentioned North Dallas, well, just go to realwealthshow.com and join. It's free to join. And then you'll get access to different teams in those markets that we've worked with at Real Wealth for over 10 years. Most of them, some are newer, but they come highly recommended by our over 70 7,000 members. If one of the teams that we refer people to gets complaints, they are no longer on the list. So you can have confidence knowing the people on our referral list at Real Wealth have a great track record. Again, just go to realwealthshow.com. And we are now merging my syndication company, Grow Developments, back into the umbrella of Real Wealth. It was just too confusing to have two different names. So we're rebranding uh, my syndication company, Grow Developments, to Real Wealth Developments. And you can find that at realwealthshow.com as well to find out more about our Ridgewater project in Oregon. We brought about, I don't know, it was 15 investors to Oregon to see how beautiful the area is. These lots overlook the lake. It's uh, full of trees and rolling hills. Uh, the properties start around, uh, I don't know, 550, six, I think maybe 650, depending on the lot that you get. Um, the syndication is still open for investment. It is a 12.5% preferred return, and we are expecting to start to begin returning capital within a year because all the development work has been done already from the former developer. We have options on the land, uh, so we get to buy over 100 of these lots, but we don't have to pay for them until closing, until we've built the house and we have an end buyer. So a lot, most of the development risk has been eliminated. Some of my other projects are delayed because of COVID, because um, it was so hard to get materials and supplies and interest rates went up and all the things that have made development hard. We don't have to do any of that on this project. It's already been done. We got the lots for 50% of their value and we don't even have to pay for them until the end sale. We're already in, in construction mode. We have two model homes up. You can see pictures of those model homes on our website at realwealthshow.com. Uh, just click on the syndication part, Real Wealth Developments. You can also probably still go to growdevelopments.com to get you there. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me here. I am Kathy Fedke and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.